Hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Rachel. That is the R in the RK Stumbling Bear, and I am a reader and a writer. And we're back today to go over my best books of 2023. To be fair, this is my best novels and novellas of 2023. And to give some stats to start off with, to kind of put things in context, I read 134 books. And I'm using books as a light term because I do record single short stories if I read them by as not part of a collection. So books is a loose term, but I did finish 134 items. So these are going to be my top 12 favorites for the novels and novellas category. I will do have two other videos for other groupings of categories after this video. So again, I use Copile to rate my books and the way it's set up is anything that gets a 9 on a 10 point scale and higher is considered a 5 star. And I've kind of grouped them by what was their number out of 10. So coming in at the nine, so they're five stars. They work really well for me. I have three books and one novella. I have The Last Gifts of the Universe by Rory August, which actually was the winner of the self-published science fiction contest year two. I have The Monsters We Defy by Leslie Penelope. I have The House of the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune, and To Sail Beyond the Botnet by Suzanne Palmer. And this was the novella. For The Last Gifts of the Universe, this is following Scout, who is an archivist with their brother. And it's just them on the ship and then their cat, which I think is named Pumpkin. And they're going around two dead planets, trying to find knowledge to find out what happened. Right now, their society is the only one that is active and alive. Something always takes out these other societies before a new society, I guess, kind of blossoms into maturity. And it scouts trying to figure out what's going on and comes upon a planet that has a beacon and goes to retrieve it. In the process of retrieving it, a corporation from their world arrives and takes the spoil. But while they were retrieving it, they did a recording. So they have the information. They just don't have the physical hard drive itself. And Scout and their brother, they listen to the recording, decide to go to the next location that is mentioned. Especially as the alien from the recording has mentioned that they are going to give their last gifts to the universe. And it becomes a space opera adventure as Scout and their brother are competing against this corporation duo to retrieve all these beacons and the information to get to the last world where the last stand happened. Underneath the space opera adventure, this is a story about grief and Scout is processing the death of their mother and how they feel about that. As Scout is listening to the recording of the alien Blarina from the first world, Blarina is talking about how they got to their position and you have that grief theme mirrored in Blarina's story. It was really excellent read. Not what I was expecting when I first picked it up, but one that I think is more nuanced than most people would realize when they think, oh, space opera adventure. I then read The Monsters We Defy by Leslie Penelope. And this is like a urban fantasy with paranormal vibes. It's set in the like early 1900s in Washington, DC. It very much is giving you a feel of what it was like to be black in Washington, D.C. in the 19, early 1900s. So this also has a historical element. The main character, Clara, was a real person. Some real events inspired this story where Clara was accused of murdering a white police officer and went to jail, but then was later acquitted. And this is kind of like following her afterwards, like what were the circumstances around it with that paranormal twist? The author did say that the, the character, I think her real birth name was Clara, but she went by another name. 
Leslie Penelope did say that she had taken some things from Claire and then made up a lot because there's no other information about this woman after she got acquitted. So Clara, the paranormal aspect is she is able to see spirits. She was born at a crossroads and she can communicate with them and she can help other people communicate with them as well. But when people ask the spirits for something, they can get what is called a gift or is what they want, but then they also get a curse and they don't get to choose what the curse is. And you get an example pretty early on into the book of what that can look like. One of these spirits reaches out to Clara and asks Clara to steal a ring from the hand of a very famous woman in Washington DC society. And Clara has to get a group together to go take care of that. And then there's a bigger mystery afoot. Many of the black youth are disappearing and nobody knows why. Then I also read for the first time The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. This is a book that my supervisor had been after me to read for a couple years. In fact, when I asked what her favorite book of 2022 was, she says, my favorite book of 2021 was this book. You know, really telling me this is what she wanted me to read. She did eventually tell me what her favorite book of 2022 was, but she wanted me to read this. So I finally picked it up this summer and really enjoyed it. This is following Linus Baker, who is a child care social worker who goes and inspects orphanages to make sure that they are taking care of the children in their care and the orphanages he inspects are those for magical children. He is sent to an orphanage that is secret that nobody under a certain clearance level knows about and he's only given some very brief information about the people there. And his job is to inspect to make sure that the welfare for the children are being met. And while he's there, he gets to know each of the children more than he normally does in a, during an inspection. And he gets to meet their caretaker, Arthur Parnassus. He begins to get his world shifted in some interesting ways. And the children in this book are just so heartwarming. This is very much a found family sort of story. And then for the novella in this category, I have To Sail Beyond the Botnet by Suzanne Palmer. Suzanne Palmer has written a series of stories that have appeared in Clark's world following Bot 9. And the first one, Bot 9, is woken up. The ship has asked it to go take care of a rodent problem. And while the Bot 9 is doing that, it finds out that the ship is on a suicide mission. Or at least yeah, the crew and ship are on a suicide mission. And it's trying to figure out why. And it kind of goes through how the spot is very creative and innovative and doesn't always complete the mission the way Ship wants them to. It does take care of the rodent problem, but in a very interesting way. So this is just following Bot 9 later on. Bot 9 wakes up in their fabricator outside of the ship. But like the fabricator has been expelled out of the ship and it's trying to figure out why it has been sent off into space. I really love Bot 9. I think if you like Murderbot, you would like Bot 9. So these stories, again, are on Clark's world, not behind a paywall. They're easy to find. You should go find them. So moving on to the next category, I think is this one's the 9.14. I have two books here. I first have What Moves the Dead by T. King Fisher. This is a retelling based off of a story by Edgar Allan Poe, The House of Usher, where we are following a soldier as the soldier comes to visit their friends and finds that not everything is well in this manor house and nor are his friends. I'm not much of a horror person typically, but this book is very atmospheric and because I have and because I am already familiar with the source material from film classes, it was a really fun ride for me. I also have Babel by R.F. Kuang. I don't have the actual book with me. I've loaned it out to my parents to read, so I just had the desk cover. This follows Robin Swift, who at the start of the book is sick in Canton, China, and a man named Professor Lovell comes and finds him, picks him up, and takes him off to... England with the agreement that Robin is going to do what the professor says. 
and the professor wants to train them up to be a linguist to go to the school called Babel. And this is a historical fantasy, and the fantasy elements are the magic system, which is based off of language. You can take silver bars and you can you can put a pair of translated words on either side and it will do magic based off of what the gap is in that translation. So it's a very interesting and unique system. And then Kwong in this book talks a lot about language and translation, which I really loved, as well as the social events that were going on during the Industrial Revolution. In this book, it's called the Silver Industrial Revolution, but that is based off of real history. And this was a fantastic read. Then for the 9.29 category, I have three books here. I have Nebula Vibrations by Annie Carl, which is a novella that I read at the very beginning of the year, and one that I nominated for the Hugo Awards. It didn't make it, though. This follows a woman who is woken up on a generation ship. She is a famous science fiction author who is taken from Earth without her consent. So when she wakes up, and finds out what's going on, she is pissed. And the people who've woken her up are asking her to go do a first contact with an alien race. And again, she is pissed. And so she doesn't really see why she should have to help them out at all. She eventually does go to the alien ship, and then she gets a nice surprise. And the reason why she got woken up is because this is this generation ship society has done so many implants that when the aliens try to communicate with them, there's a vibration that then kills the humans. And this science fiction author, who I can't remember her name, because she's been frozen, she does not have those implants. So that's why it's safe for her to go talk to the aliens. Then I read The Trellis by Jules Cantor. This was one of the self-published science fiction contest reads of year two, and I just really enjoyed this. This is a near future sci-fi where we are following Debbie as she is a conflict mediator and gets hired on by a big corporation. Now in this world, there has been some troubles. Um, society has collapsed. It's kind of reformed in different ways. It's not the United States that we know now. And AI is way more prevalent. And AI is starting to take over more and more jobs. Debbie, while enjoying her new job, is very much aware it's a don't ask, don't tell kind of mentality because some things are happening that don't seem to be adding up. But at the same time, she's enjoying this job because it's a lot more pay. Her life, her overall life quality has increased and so she's not willing to rock the boat. And she slowly finds out what is going on. I then read City of Broken Magic by Mira Bolender. This was one of my picks for the Buzzwordathon, and this is an urban fantasy set in a secondary world, and we are following Laura, who is a an apprentice journeyman sweeper, I think is the term that they use. A sweeper is basically like a monster hunter. In this world, they are really only looking for a certain type of monster that likes to take root in amulets that have run out of magic and they consume living matter so that is what she's being trained to do this is kind of in a like a early 1900-esque like industrial world but you have some technology like a tram system trains phones but not everybody has their own phone and i really enjoyed it I would suggest going into this book without reading the synopsis because the book blurb definitely spoiled something that's at the ending and I think it would be better to not be expecting it. And then for my 9.43 category, I have Book Lovers by Emily Henry. This is my first Emily Henry book and I can understand why everyone really enjoys her books. I really loved how on the nose Henry plays with romance tropes this, I forget the character's name, but follows a book agent who deals with author who writes romance and is very aware of the romance tropes. Her sister wants to go on a sister trip to a small town that 
her big time client wrote about. And while there, she meets her nemesis, who is an agent. And this agent actually rejected the book that was based in this town. So those two always kind of friction. And this was a great story of two people who are very similar, who fall in love and are willing to give each other the space to be who they are. This was kind of same type of people attract, which you don't see very often in romance. And again, it just plays with all the romance tropes where, you know, usually it's a big city gal or big city guy goes to a small town and falls in love with a small town person. I'm going to ruin it for you. That trip is flipped on its head already. If you really like romance and don't mind a romance book that pokes some fun at romances, you will really enjoy this one. And then for my 9.71 category, I have a novella and a novel. And the novella is A Dash of Romance by Paulette Golden. And the novel is Trust of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. Starting with the novella, A Dash of Romance by Paulette Golden. I actually got this from my voracious readers. This is a Regency romance where Abigail Walsley dreams to be a writer. And she's the daughter of a vicar. A local aristocrat with neighbor wants her to be a companion. She keeps saying no. And so then that aristocratic neighbor tells her son to go marry her. And she rejects him and then describes her fictional knight character. This neighbor male goes to try to find the guy to get him to break off the engagement so that he can marry her and she can get be a caretaker and companion to his mother, which then leads you to the second POV, which is Percival Randall, who is a second son who has been given the ultimatum to marry by the age of 30. But if he doesn't, he's going to get cut off and be penniless and put out on the street. And he's in the process of courting someone and then that family cuts him off and he slowly finds out that Supposedly, he ha is engaged to somebody who he's never met, and he goes to confront Abigail about it, and they find that this situation might work for them for a, both of them for a while, and sparks fly, and it's a romance. They fall in love. That's not a spoiler. <laughs> if it's a romance, they fall in love. And then my favorite book of the year is Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. This was one of his books for the year of Sanderson. So Sanderson's actually a hit or miss author. I don't love everything he writes, but this one I really did. And then just starting off where we are following Tress, who likes cups, collects different cups, and lives on an island where the islanders are not allowed to leave. At the beginning of the book, she has already fallen in love with the Duke's son. And the Duke's son, Charlie, is sent off to find a bride, but he promises he won't and he'll come back and marry her. And then he gets kidnapped by the Wicked Witch. And Tress decides to take matters into her own hand because nobody else is going to do it. And you get to go on this like pirate adventure in this very interesting world. I just absolutely loved it, which is why it's my favorite book of the year. What has been your favorite books of the year? I would love to know down below. If you are also a booktuber and do these videos, leave me a link down below so I can go watch. Thank you and have a great day.